I'm going to have you start by saying and spelling your complete name. No, my complete name. I told you I found, found out my name was Paul Joseph. And at home I always went Joe, Joe Paul, and Joe Paul Perro. They say Perro. Well, in service they say Paul Peralt. So I, I suffered because of that. Well, I'll let you decide how to say and spell whatever name you're picking here. Oh, okay. <laughs> you want to go with? Joe. Joe. Okay. Yeah. And spell your last name, please. P-E-R-R-A-U-L-T. And your highest rank served in the 10th Mountain Division? Highest rank served? PFC. And the year that you were inducted or you enlisted? I signed a voluntary induction papers in, in March of 1943. I went in in April. So you started at Hale? I went right to Camp Hale, yeah. And the unit that you served with? The unit that you served with in the 10th Mountain Division? With the 126th Engineer Battalion, okay. Company D. Okay, great. Um, tell me a little bit about how you came to be in the 10th Mountain Division. Well, uh, I'm... Minot Dole from out east pushed for, for ski troops and uh, he was with the National Ski Patrol. So the arrangements were made. We had a, a, a gentleman from Marquette, that uh, Art Hebel, he was in the ski patrol. And we went through him and he entered us through the National Ski Patrol. And then we had a letter, in fact, I just saw it today. We had a letter, and when we went to the separ uh, Fort Sheridan, our induction center, all we had to do was show that letter, and, and our, our orders were sent right to Camp Hale then. What made you want to be in the tent? Because I skied. Although I didn't downhill ski, we, uh, around the town, all we did was jump, ski jumping. Uh, did you have to have three letters of recommendation, or...? Could you skip that because you were a jumper? Well, Art Hebel took care of the, the uh, recommendations, see. Um, before you went into the uh, 10th Mountain Division, were you already a pretty capable rifleman and had, had a lot of outdoor experience? Well, I've always done hunting and that ever since I was small, so. Um, when you got into the 10th, can you just tell me a little bit about what you thought about the quality of the officers? Well, the interesting story to me was when I went up to Camp Hill, of course, the ski troops were the infantry. And I had played trumpet when I was in, well, at home in the municipal bands. And uh, I wasn't in the infantry very long, maybe two weeks, and the engineers were looking for a bugler. So I got sent down to be a bugler. And when I got down to the engineers, I realized what my dad told me in the First World War, they used to shoot the bugler. So I didn't want him to play that bugle, although I, I could play it easily. After two weeks, the first sergeant sent me out on the field with the rest of the, of the troop. Well, that was a good deal. At least you did, didn't get shot then, did you? Uh, tell me a little bit about... Um when you were training over at Camp Hale, what, what kind of things did you have to do as an engineer? What kind of things did you do at Camp Hale that prepared you for war in terms of being an engineer? Well, we, we uh, put up uh, practice tramways, aerial tramways, which we did use over in Italy. And, of course, there was work on minefields, uh, detecting the fields and clearing them. And we done a lot of bridge building. When you um, practice building tramways, were you building the same tramway in practice that ended up being built at the base of River Ridge? The one big one we built in Camp uh, Hill was under the direction of Major Roberling from Roberling Cable. And that uh, tramway could carry a jeep up. It was uh, big uh, I-beam towers that we put up. And uh, we did put a few smaller ones up which were similar to what we use over in, in Italy. Um, where did those practice tramways go to and from at Camp Hill? At Camp Hill? We were out beyond the, uh, the rifle range 
I can't remember what the area was called, but we had an area out there. It was away from the camp, within a couple of miles maybe from the camp. So did you put up, did you help put up the tramway at the bottom of River Ridge in Italy? Did you work on that? On that tramway, yes. So you actually had a, a bunch of sort of dress rehearsals putting up that tramway by putting up the exact same tramway at Camp Ale? Right. That was uh, the tram that uh, we put up at uh, Belvedere or Riva Ridge was was uh, uh, how can I say it? It was it was done at night, in one night. It was a simple simple towers. They were just two poles crossed at the top, tied, and and they were guy wired off, and then the uh, the haul cable was tied. Uh, from the center of that. How did you do it at night? With, did you have many lights? You, the reason they done it at night is because the Germans were on the top of the ridge watching. And you couldn't very well work during the daylight because they, could, they were, were able to shoot at you. So it was decided to do it, done it at night. And did you have very much available light? Pardon? Did you have very much available light to do it at night? No, I'm mostly in the dark. It wasn't any real moonlight night, I remember that. It wasn't real bright. But it's, it was tools that we worked with that we knew. We knew what we had. How many of you were there putting together that tramway at River Ridge? First of all, we had trouble getting the supplies over. The road was real muddy, and it got so bad that they had to get a, a bulldozer up there to try to pull our trailers that had the equipment on and the, the motor and the cables and that. We had a hard time getting that over. That was all done over two or three days before, which was a good thing. All at night. Because this was all supposedly coordinated with, with the, uh, the division moving up the ridge and taking the ridge. And the big thing about it was that it was taking anywhere from six to seven hours to take a wounded man down off of the ridge. With the tramway, it was between six to eight minutes down, and then they hauled ammunition and supplies back up. When you were building it, were you, um, this was all before River Ridge, though. You kind of started the base of it before River Ridge then? I Did you start it before the River Ridge operation? Right, right. We had to start before that. This was, this was all tied in with the invasion of the ridge. See, I didn't realize they started putting it together before River Ridge. I just thought it was all after they captured it. Oh, okay. Well, that makes sense. Uh, did you ever get a ride in it? No, I didn't want to ride in that. That was the basket there. That was for wounded. Although they did, they were able to carry a, a medic and a wounded man at a time down. So if they, had some of the more seriously wounded, they had attendance on the way down. What was the most difficult part about building that tramway? I guess we were trying to climb the hill in the, in the dark and put up the towers. How did you drive the things? How deep did you have to go in with? Wherever they put the, just like a tent peg, you, you draw, drove them in, although they were steel pegs instead. Wow. Yeah, that's like frozen rock. It wasn't all rock. No, no. This, this area had been scouted pretty thorough by some of our people. Our, so they knew just where we could go up there and how we could get up there. Because you, you had to be able to dig a trench with what we call a dead man, a log in the trench and covered to anchor the top of that. And at the bottom there was the, the rock which now has a plaque on it. That's what, it was anchored to that rock at the bottom. Uh, did you feel a lot of pressure when you were building that tram? I don't know what you mean by pressure. I mean, it was a job we had to do. Mm -hmm. And there was nobody to come alongside you to do it for you. So if you had something to do, you better do your part. What was your part, exactly? I, uh, I'd done different jobs on the, on the tramway. I was a, a sort of a, you say, a handyman or something. Yeah. I, <laughs> like, what were some of the things? Well, you helped tie off the cables and, 
and help string the cables. Okay. Is there anything else about the tramway that you want to tell me before we move on? I just feel that it's not, it's not publicized enough for how important it was at that time. But uh, I think you'll find a lot of infantrymen that were sure glad that it was there. How many men actually came down in that wounded? I would have no idea. Because that was, that was only, uh, maybe it was there a week, I don't know. Did you take it apart too? Uh, I, I doubt it. I think, it, as far as I know, we moved up, so it might have been left to somebody else. To take apart. I didn't realize that. Um, when you were building it, did you realize it was going to be such an important part about resupplying the ridge? Did you realize it was going to be important? Well, we we had to know working at night to put it up and that that it was it was something then when you when you saw what was happening when you saw them bringing these people down that fast uh, you know you ha you had to save some lives did you see a lot of wounded people coming down on litters well we we didn't all see it. we just had crews running the running the uh, operation there might have been five or six men on the crew that were there and then they alternated hours. When you were uh, working on the tram, were you able to observe the battle of the different operations of Reaver we could We could hear everything where we were. They were up above. We could hear it. In fact, uh, I remember going over one day with uh, some people from the, the uh, mess sergeant had food to bring over there and I was driving a jeep over. I had the, the one of the cooks with me, and I'm going across the field towards the bottom of the of the tram, and the, the shells were going off out in the field, and the, he asked me what that was. I said, "Well, that's shells. <laughs> Get me out of here," he said. <laughs> see, they could they could see us moving down below, from up on the top. Well, that's a little close, I guess. <laughs> Now, after you guys moved on forward, uh, what was the next uh, bit of work that you guys had to do after Reaver Ridge? Oh, memory is is hard. Although I do remember Lake Garda, there were uh, a series, I think, of five or six tunnels, and as it was just steep cliffs down to the lake, and the the Germans had blasted two of the tunnels. As we were moving up, uh, our people were ferrying infantry around these tunnels in boats. And in the meantime, we were bulldozing to open the tunnels again. So that was, that was quite a job. They were right, the Germans were right on the other side of the lake. You could see them moving over there. They could see us moving. Were they? Uh... But they were on the, on the, starting to get on the run. And, were they still lobbing shells at you guys? Oh, yeah. yeah. Did you ever duck into the tunnels? No, I don't think I did. But you might duck into the tunnel for a cover. Um, do you remember the April Offensive? April Offensive? You mean uh, the Po Valley? Yeah, before you went into the Po Valley? Yes, I can remember that very well. Uh, did you clear a lot of minefields then? or? We were that? moving pretty fast going to the Pole River, and uh, I remember driving a, a D7 bulldozer across a good part of the valley, which is a rough ride in a tractor, because they were using our trucks and our equipment that we haul the tractors with for hauling infantry to bring them up to the river. Well, at least you didn't have to walk. No. <laughs> I did walk sometimes because the machine would drift. I'd get out and walk, and then the machine would start to drift, and I'd have to jump on it again. Um, did you have occasion to clear mines in, in like, the March Offensive or near De La Terracia? Well, the one, the one mine deal that I got into, with the, uh, the lieutenant and the sergeant and I went ahead on this small road 
and uh, we're checking for minefields and the sergeant got hit. And I brought him back and then knowing that I had been up that road, I took a jeep and went back up They got the sergeant. I ended up with a silver star for that. So. Ah, so that's how you got your silver star. That's how I got it, yeah. Uh, what was the date of that? Do, do you remember the date? I just looked at it today. It was the fourth day of the month. Now, if that was May, could have been May. That would have been at Lake Garda. Was it at Lake Garda? Was it at Lake Garda? No, it was past Lake Garda. Past Lake yeah. Garda? Yeah. Hmm. Did you bring it with you? Did you bring it with you? Which, the star? Or your citation? The orders? No, it's, I don't have it with me. It's home. Oh. I brought Don some of the stuff I had at home, but that I don't think that's included in it. Knock, knock. The horsepower motors on them. And <laughs> what was happening, you'd bring the, the troops around these tunnels, and then we'd race, coming back, running races with them boats. And the high brass spotted us, and we, <laughs> we got burned for that. Oh, like you were goofing around. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're doing this when you think of it, and the Germans are watching you on the other side. Yeah, you're not supposed to be doing that, right? Well, you're not supposed to be running races with the boats. <laughs> yeah. Go back to the Po River and tell me a little bit about what you, what you did as an engineer at the Po River. What I remember most of the Po was uh, when I got there with that D7 dozer, back from the river back there were... were banks, high banks, and uh, we, I had a dozer path through that to get down to the river to put the uh, pontoon bridge in. So I remember doing that. So you were there, the troops were there, but the boats weren't there, and you were getting the boats down to the river. Yeah, yeah. So, now, did you help paddle boats across the river? Did you help paddle boats across the river? Oh, yeah, so you could, everybody got their turn paddling. <laughs> What was that like? Uh, <laughs> well, you hurry up and get back. I mean, the quicker you get more men over, the better it was. How many guys in a boat? I see. I, I I'm get, get confused between Lake Garda and the pole. Lake Garda, we had these good sized boats, and they weren't that big on at the pole. But I would say. You had at least 12, maybe 15 people, including the two engineers that were peddling. And what was the shelling situation like there? What was the shelling situation like? I didn't get you. What was the shelling situation like as you were going across the They road? were shelling. They were shelling some, but uh, we had them, they had them pretty well under control then. It wasn't that bad for us. How many trips across the Poe River did you make? I might have made two. I mean, you, you you took turns. Now, did you stay around the Poe River and work on the bridge then after? Well, that was the next step to get that bridge across. Did you work on that bridge? Oh, yes. Now, how, tell me what it was like to build that bridge. How long? What was it like to build it? How did you build that bridge? Well, you, you, we had to run a cable across first because it's all anchored to a cable. And then the, uh, the pontoons were pushed out there, and then you had your ramps tying them all together. It was, it was a regular, uh, regular bridge. The, the equipment was, was designed for where, where it was going. It was just a matter of the length. So you just keep adding sections of pontoons until you reach the other shore. Yeah. Is that how it works? Mm-hmm. Uh, let's talk about another bridge. Um, did you work on the Melandroni Bridge? No. Nope. Yeah. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit more about the mine, about clearing the minefield. Well, we had uh, four engineer companies, and uh, I don't think D company had that much because we had heavy equipment to work with. 
but uh, the other companies done a lot of a lot of clearing. Now you said you had to clear a minefield, right? I I went up to short road with the lieutenant and, and the uh, sergeant. Yes. Now, what were the events that led you getting a silver star? Well, it was it was taking care of the sergeant and and then getting the jeep and bringing them back through the mines. And um, were the mines shoe mines or what kind of mines were they? Could you see what they were? Bouncing uh, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't remember. I know we we probed we probed uh, every spot that looked bad. Uh, it might have been dug up, and uh, and you'd always mark them because then they, the others would come through and and uh, detonate them or. Take them out. Were you under fire during that time? Not, not until we got to the this farmhouse up there. That, that's when, when the sergeant got hit. And then what happened? It happened. I picked them up and carried them in the, into the house, put them on the table, and bandaged them up, and then the lieutenant sent me back to get the jeep. Through that same. Done minefield. what I was told. <laughs> Through the same minefield. So you went through that same minefield a couple times? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't a minefield, it was a little road and they had placed some mines in it. It wasn't a big field because there was no definite pattern to it. Do you know anybody who stole two tanks? Do you know anybody who stole two tanks? Where did you hear that story? Ah? <laughs> uh? <laughs> yeah. We were stationed in Virginia, <laughs> and we had a, a, a tank crew there. And uh, they had medium and light tanks. And we had guard duty. And a friend of mine and I went out on guard duty, and he, a live drove, drove bulldozer. So I thought I could drive a tank. So he said, we should go for a ride. He said, I'd like to ride in the tank. So we jumped in the tank. Got it started and off we went. We didn't go very far and it stopped. What are we going to do now? Here we're on guard duty. So I, <laughs> I told him we better go get another one and try to pull this one back. So we got another one. <laughs> got as far as the other tank and that stopped. Then I figured <laughs> we're going we're gonna to go to prison for sure. So we went back and the, the this tank crew were, were assigned to us, so they were they weren't like uh, of the company. So they started to laugh right away. So two of the guys come back with us, and what had happened was there was a shutoff valve for fuel, <laughs> and when they parked the tank, they always shut that off. I didn't know that. <laughs> so then he told us, how, "You want a ride?" He said, "I'll give you a ride," and he did give us a ride. A good thing there's a seat belts in it because we had a ride. But <laughs> those things happen, I guess. <laughs> Did you get in trouble? No, never heard nothing. They never said nothing, so. <laughs> uh, it would have really been bad because of the fact that we were we were on guard. <laughs> oh, I think there were lots of tricks like that pulled in service. Boys will be boys. <laughs> Do you know anybody who stole onions? Stole onions? Stole onions? No. Steal onions ever? I ate onions like apples when I was a when I was a youngster at home, but not not in service. Well, uh, somebody told me to ask you about stealing onions. Peeling onions. Oh, well, he said stealing. Well, maybe he said peeling. Maybe I'm deaf. Well, we. We got a crew that works for the Elks Club and the VFW, and we peel onions and potatoes for pasties. <laughs> well, that might be a little off topic. I don't know who you've been talking to, but I'd like to find out. <laughs> uh, how about if we talk a little bit more? Is there anything else you want to tell us about your service in, in Italy before we move on? I want to talk a little bit about your ski team experience. Anything about my service? In Italy. What's your most memorable experience when you when you think about it? Getting back home. Yeah. It was a great feeling. We landed in 
Virginia and uh, had a troop train coming to Camp McCoy. And we were in the stockyards in Chicago when the, the war was over. So there was a lot of horns blowing, whistles, sirens. And there was another troop train alongside of us that were heading to the Pacific. Those fellows jumped out of them cars and they hit right for town. Because I remember talking to a lieutenant from the train and he said, uh, what are you going to do? He said, you can't shoot them all. He said, we just got to hope they come back. The war was over with. They weren't. <laughs> what was the uh, worst experience that you had during battle? The work experience? Worst experience. Uh, well, I was young and enjoyed what I was doing. I mean, you you liked to take a dare or anything. And, but I don't know if it was, any, it was real any bad experiences, but now when you think back, some of them were pretty scary, all right, but you didn't think of it at the time. Like, uh, can you give me, like, a for instance? Example? Hmm. Well, it was pretty scary with the sergeant when he got when he got hit standing alongside of me. But then at the moment you don't think about it. You do what you have to do. And then afterwards you're thinking, hey, I was standing next to him. It could have just as well been me. Can you think of uh, any experiences during the your time in Italy that were sort of humorous? Humorous? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, I just thought I'd ask. That's sort of a standard question. Um, how would you uh, describe the, um, the feelings of the Italian partisans? Did you have occasion to work with them at all? The partisans? Yeah. The one real experience I had with one is I had, uh, after the war was over, we were doing some rebuilding bridges and roadways, and uh, I had writing home in that there was a gentleman from Bergamo in Italy that had been over in this country and worked at the mines with my dad and had gone back to Italy. His brother was in, in our town in Ishpeming. And we got his address, and I was making arrangements to go and visit this was uh, Italian. And uh, I had a partisan arranged to go with me if there was any uh, language problem. And I had arranged for a jeep. And the weekend that I was going to go, they moved us out. I would like to have gotten over and seen that that gentleman that had worked with my dad over here in this country. When you guys moved out after uh, Lake Garda, did you move up to the uh, Aust Austrian-Italian border? Well, we I went up as far as Yugoslavia with because I remember getting cherries, beautiful cherries up there, but just hauling uh, troops. And then we used to take some on the rest uh, and relaxation over in in um, Venice. And did they use you as a driver? Did they use you as a driver? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my job. <laughs> so you did a lot of driving in right. between yeah. here and there. Come on, see, I never knew that. Denise, can you think of any other engineering engineering questions we should follow up with? Because you know so much more about that. Do you remember a farmhouse that had a bunch of wine? Do you remember a farmhouse that had a bunch of wine? Oh, we had, we had a lot of wine up around Lake Garda. We ran into a warehouse. <laughs> and not only wine, <laughs> vodka and everything else. Everybody got a bottle. You, you didn't know what you were going to get when you went through the line. They give you a bottle, <laughs> whatever it was. What did you get? I don't know what it was, but I traded it for candy. <laughs>
<laughs> well, that shows where you were at. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Might have some cavities, but that's yeah. terrible. Um, can you think of anything else about the wine? Well, there was a lot. There was a lot. Of, a lot of big heads for a while. A lot of people suffering. <laughs> a lot of hangovers. Oh, a lot of hangovers. Yeah. What, uh, what was it that got you through during some of the more difficult moments? Well, I think prayer. I'm I'm Catholic and. Uh, I never miss going to church, and uh, I think I said a few extra ones over there. Were there times when you thought you might not survive? No, no. I never, I never looked at that. You think you used up nine lives? You think you used up nine lives? <laughs> no, I don't know. I think I got some more left. When you were up in Yugoslavia border, did you could could you tell that there was sort of a tension among the troops uh, regarding Tito's partisans? Well, it was so quick when we were there that we we never stayed long, and it was mostly a loop and passing around. That's all, drop off uh, troops or whatever, and, and keep going. I mean, but. After the war was over in Italy, it was great. I mean, boy, you were, everybody was applauding you. And What do you remember about the day that the war ended, there was armistice in Italy, that would have been May 2nd? Well, every, everybody was pretty happy about it, I'll tell you. Like I say, it was, you knew you were, you were going to start going home. Okay. Anything else that you want to cover about battle and training? Anything else you want to add before I move on? No. <laughs> okay. Um, hey, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the skiing that you did when you did come home. Uh, what ski team, tell me about when you came home, uh, what ski team you went on to. Well, I was on the 1948-1952 Olympic team, and I was in the 1950 World Championships in Lake Placid. 48, we were in Switzerland. I did compete there, I placed, placed 15th. In, uh, in 52, we were sent to Wisconsin to train, and I, uh, I was, took a somersault, crushed some vertebrae, so I sat that one out. I didn't get to go to Norway, which I really, really wanted to have gone. But, but then and that was all. Um, what, were you, what were you competing in exactly? Ski jumping. Yeah. Now, when you were training for the 48 Olympics, were you working too? Yes, yeah. So what's it like to train for the Olympics and have a full-time job? <laughs> it's tough. It's tough, but it's it's altogether different today. Now our, our American team is over in Europe all the time training, and but. Well, when did you have time to train if you had a full time job? When did I have time to train? Well, on weekends, in the evenings, you might get out and get one or two jumps on the hill. Time. Working. I was at, I was with the uh, research department at the, at the uh, mining company. So that's, that's pretty unusual, don't you think? Yeah, unusual. Yeah. Not necessarily. I mean, uh, we were working on this. What they eventually came into a pelletizing, and. Uh, it's what really got us started up here, and that, that took mining back into the game again up here. Well, I guess, I, I mean, it's unusual to have you by day research scientists, by night Olympic, you know, <laughs> team member. Well, I ne never thought of it that way. <laughs> I never thought myself as a research scientist. Uh, who was your coach up here? Up here? Yeah. We coached each other. 
The only time I, I skied under a coach is in the Olympics. Outside of that, we, we coach each other. Who was your Olympic coach? Walter Prager. And what was Walter like as a coach? Uh, I take that back. Alf Engen was our coach in 48. And Harold Sorensen was a coach in Lake Placid in 1950. And I think he was also the coach in 52. Was Nelson Bennett ever a coach with you? No. Not with you, okay. No. Um, who else were your teammates? Well, the uh, 50, I often, I've often felt that this is, hasn't been brought up, but the uh, 52 and the uh, 48 and the 52 Olympic teams, there are six, six members on a team, on a jumping team. And three of the 50% of the team was from Ishpeming, both years. Which, when you're looking at the whole United States, and you've got 50% uh, of your team from, from one little town. But I, I, you very seldom hear that mentioned when they talk about ski jumping, and I often wonder why. Um, did you have other teammates that were 10th Mountain? Uh, I think Crosby Perry Smith was on the team. In fact, I believe he took my place in 52 when I got hurt. And there were some others, and I, I, uh, offhand I can't think of them. Of course, Alf Engen, his brother, one of the two, uh, one of his brothers was, was in the Tenth Mountain. Now, at that same time, that in the downhill ski uh, team, there was a the number of Tenth guys. Were you aware of that? The downhill team? Yeah, that had other Tenth guys in it. Well, Gordon Wren was one on the team that, in 1948, I think he should have competed in all four events, but they, he, he had to take two, and he picked the jumping, special jumping, and the combine, and which is cross country and jumping. But uh, when we were training in Davos, I watched him many times over with the Solom and the downhill team, and <laughs> he was as good as any of them over there. But they, they wouldn't allow him to compete in four events. Well, if he's that good, why wouldn't? I guess they don't want anybody monopolizing. Is that why? I don't know what the reasoning are, but. Um, when you came off the team in the last time you were on, uh, did you go back to the same job or did you do something else? I was still in the same same work, research work. Yeah. And then did you go on to coach others? Coach? Coach. I, I started a junior ski club at home. And uh, uh, that was, that had to be in the mid-40s or uh, late-40s. And I stayed with that for a while. And then I had a good friend of mine that was a skier that took it over when I went to Switzerland. So did you actually stay in Switzerland and train there for a while then? Did I enjoy it? Uh, no, it, it sounds like you actually trained in Switzerland for a while and you stayed there. We used to have to walk out to the hill every day in St. Moritz. And we, we were in Davos first. And then uh, we moved to St. Moritz and, and uh, we used to walk out to the hill and back every day. Now, as a ski jumper, now you got to tell me some of the tips. <laughs> what are your top tips for not crashing and burning when you're uh, ski jumping? What are the, what's the key secrets? <laughs> I, I couldn't tell you. It's so different today. Ski jumping is so much different today. Well, how was it? Every different? skier comes off today, they look alike. Really? Well, yeah. well how was it in your day? Because you, you, you ski with your skis in a certain position today. And we didn't do that. We wanted to ski close together. But there's a theory behind it that 
you get more lift. As an airplane wing goes through the air, you form a partial vacuum over the top, which gives you lift. Well, if you've got two skis out here and a body in between, you're getting lift from three. Where if you, your skis are in front of you and you're over them, you only got the one plane that's for lift. Were you inspired at all by the legend of Torrey Tofel before you joined the, the 10th Mountain Division? I spent uh, time in, in Steamboat Springs with, with Torger. Torger and Alf Engen, we, they made a, we made a, uh, a movie, a short, on mo uh, jumping with Otto Lang. And uh, Torger was a, he was a great guy and he was a powerful ski jumper. What was he like as a person? He was as common as could be. He was just normal. I mean, he had a lot of confidence in himself. Um, can you think of anything else you want to add about Torger? Topo? I wish he could have lived. Got a, he had he had an impressive record before. The only one one that I know of that could have probably get, come close to him, and that was one of the Beatle boys, Paul Beatle. And he was hurt and died from it in a fall in St. Paul, Minnesota. Up to that point, he was untouchable. Um, how do you think that being in the 10th Mountain Division shaped your life? How do you think being in the 10th Mountain Division shaped your life? How it shaped my life? Maybe I grew up a little quicker. I was just 18 when I went in. I'm glad I had the experience. I mean, I don't know if I'd want to do it again, but there's a difference in age now, too, so. What does it mean to you to have been in the 10th Mountain Division? What does it mean to you to have been in the 10th Mountain Division? Well, with the, the Alumni Association, and now with our de uh, descendants, I'm, so, I'm sort of proud because uh, you, so many people are in service in different organizations and that, and uh, you don't hear uh, hear them talk about what we have. So I think it's I think it's great that we've got what we have. And this now with the descendants keeping it alive. That's that's a great thing. What kind of legacy does the Tenth Mountain Division leave? What kind of legacy does the Tenth Mountain Division leave? What did they leave? Yeah, what kind of legacy? <sighs> Well, I think uh, the scholarships that they've they've taken care of has helped a, a lot of a lot of youngsters, and I think it's helped it's helped the present tent to to have that name when they know what's what's happened with us back way back. At the time that you were in the 10th, could you tell that you guys were really special? At the time you were in the 10th, could you tell that you guys were really special? Well, you always feel like your, your unit is the best. I mean, there was always that competition in, in the engineers, the co three companies. I mean, you always wanted to outdo the others. I think that's an American way, isn't it? Did you have a sense that you guys were making history? No. We were trained to do what we were doing. And How would you quantify the spirit of the tent? It was great. I mean, uh, 
I think I don't know of anyone I've ever heard that wasn't proud of the fact that he was in the tent. Do you think of anything else that we should add? No. <laughs> Anybody else? The ducks boat on Guardia. Those boats that you were running were the. It was called the ducks. The ducks on on Guardia. Those boats. What were they called? Yeah. And you were ferrying people around the tunnels, right? In you, at, at Lake Garda, were you ferrying people around the tunnels? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So you probably were in ducks, amphibious trucks. Yeah, yeah we were. <laughs> like I say, the Germans were the other side. They could see you. Yeah, I think those were ducks. Do you think of anything else? No. <laughs> All right, you can stand down. <laughs> All right, this, this picture is of which company? Okay, this is... Delta Company of the 87th. 87D. And taken in Italy, somewhere in Italy. Okay. And what can you tell me about your dad? Okay, my dad was the squad leader of this motley crew, and he's the man with the dog, uh, bottom left of the picture. That's a double, there's two of the same picture there. That's, I've, uh, I printed it out as a double yeah, I, I have you move towards me so the light comes back. I printed it, that out like that so I could cut that in half and leave, leave, send one to the uh, Denver, with whoever takes that stuff. Okay, okay, and this is, which unit again? This is a photograph of the same, uh, the three guys on the right are uh, with my dad. This is down at camp. The camp in Texas. Camp Swift? Swift. Mm -hmm. they, when they, while they were stationed at Camp Swift, uh, they would, the, the three of those would go to Mr. Tapia's ranch uh, on leave. The, they would go out and play cowboy uh, as much as they could while they were down. Swift. And these four guys are from 87? Well, the, the man on the left is Mr. Tapia. He's the father of Chuck Tapia, which is the next man to him, to the right. And uh, that his son was uh, in with my dad, and best one of his best friends, 87 Delta. Well, that probably 87 Bravo at this point, because he was in 87 Bravo until he got to Italy, and then he went to Special Weapons. And to his right is Davy Beitzel, B-E-I-T-Z-E-L-L. -L. Uh, he's he was from Cucamonga. Uh, and he was my dad's very best friend uh, through that part. So your dad is the tall guy, second? No. My dad's the guy on the far right. Far right, okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. With the, the cocked hat and the grabbing his belt. And that's Francis E. Williams. Um, like I said, this was out of Camp Swift, and they, they would just try to get away every chance they got and go up to Mr. Tapia's place. He had a ranch down there. Uh, the three of those guys, the three GIs, went to uh, uh, Italy together and uh, stayed in the 87th. And they uh, all came home. Uh, as far as I know, Chuck Tapia is still alive, supposed to be down, living down in Pueblo, Colorado. Davy Beitzel lived uh, until 1988 and passed away. And my dad uh, passed away in 92. Tell me which uh, company this is. Okay, this is the uh, uh, like a basic training unit. The their initial induction training, and this is their graduation picture at Fort Coast, Washington. Uh, I think it was probably uh, March, April of '42, and uh, that, that was the 85th graduating class. I guess. And uh, my dad is uh, fourth row up at Man Inn. Uh, and I don't know who the rest of the people are. Okay, and now we'll go to a close up of the same picture. Okay, come down from the top.
Okay, and we're talking 85, 87. This is 85B training company. They, they gave them each uh, a designation when they trained and then they were put into the regular units. And he got in there, he was trained just before they moved to Camp Pale. Did you keep a dog there? This is Jill Hahn's dad in the A&P platoon. This is Jill Hahn's dad, A&P platoon. This is me. Robert. Robert Hahn, I think. Robert Hahn on leave in Florence. This is Robert Hahn on the left. 